Welcome to the Anthro Art Podcast, a space of anthropological insight connected to real life situations. Here we explore topics of social inequality and inclusion, sustainability and the social self. We aim to bring a more nuanced understanding of our world and its challenges, but also inspiration and ideas on how to solve them together. We hope you enjoy it. Working out inclusivity through emotions, the power of vulnerability. Written and read by me, Luisa Fonini. Abstract. Showing our vulnerabilities is hard. However, not doing so will undeniably compromise our possibility to connect with others. In this essay, I share my experience in a week's research in a community home located in Amsterdam. The story that happens in the Meervaart is a gateway to talk about emotions and about the power that having resources and company to experience emotions can have for social inclusion. Introduction It is not uncommon that people pass by life without taking the time and space to actually feel what they're feeling. Whether that is because of how big and crowded our cities are, because of all the information being bombarded at us by social media, or simply because no one taught us its importance or how to do it, it doesn't matter. The fact is that education about and empowerment of our emotional capabilities are not modern society's fortes. The popularization of the idea of man as a rational being not only pushed our emotions away from our attention, but also demeaned them. In the dichotomies that shape our lives, rationality and its built-in false idea of neutrality was associated with power, strength, and masculinity, and was portrayed as something valuable. While sensibility and emotions were associated with vulnerability, fragility, femininity, and nature, aspects most often uninvited to the spotlight of community life in patriarchal societies, at least not in celebratory ways. The effects of the frame are infinite, and they cut through very dimensions of our lives. From our intimate struggles to how we structure the foundation of our communities, such as the frames we create for providing education or health, for example. Our raw emotions and our sensibility are often greeted as persona non grata, especially in our public lives. Despite that, undeniably present in us, they are the ignition for our thoughts and decisions. And so, the emotions we have are at the roots of how we conceive space and how we occupy it. Consequently, empowering people with access to tools that support the listening and recognition of their emotions, as well as effective and meaningful communication, promotes the creation of more inclusive spaces. The Meervaart In July 2023, Namla partnered up with the Meervaart in a joint effort to investigate social inclusion in the neighborhood home in the Indische Burt, located on the east side of Amsterdam. The format, a bootcamp for fast ethnography, combined methods from anthropology and design into a framework that was sharp, objective, and strict, particularly when it comes to time. Participant groups had to then come up with an intervention for the proposed topic, based on what they could gather from it after a week of research. In a group formed by six anthropologists and one artist, the atmosphere that set the tone for the beginning of this journey was of doubt, confusion, and apprehension. The Meervaard is a Burt house, or a neighborhood home, as some of my informants translated. In its English translation, Meervaard means to sail together. And what this bottom-up initiative does is to offer space and gather initiatives that members of the local community that are interested in offering or participating in a myriad of activities, such as dancing, cooking, and art or language classes. The Meervaard's goal is to unite people and move together towards a more solidary future. While writing this, I am reminded of the words used by the organization's director when explaining to me what the goal of the Meervaard was. Quote, The goal is that people walk out better than they came in. End quote. Beautiful and simple as that. Or at least that's what he made it sound like. I entered the space of the Meervaard thinking about inclusivity. 
I remembered being there before and feeling good, but the memory didn't have much more definition than that. What does that feel like to me? I think about feeling welcomed with everything that I am and I am not. I think about feeling like I am important to those around me and that how I feel matters. I think about being able to participate in things that make life meaningful to me. My body warms up with the images that come up following my thoughts when I imagine those needs being cared for. Feeling inclusivity. The director of the Brut House joined us in the first hours of the boot camp to fill us in on their perspective of the issue. The director had not been born in the Netherlands, but grew up here. He lived most of his life in Amsterdam and had been active in the neighborhood initiatives taking place in the industry board for at least half a decade. A joyful person, he showed up to work in relaxed jeans, a t-shirt and flip-flops, which altogether gave me the impression that he must live nearby, as if anything else he might need besides those three items of clothing would be either right there at the Meervaard or in which just across the street. It seemed to me that he was a very approachable person, an impression that was confirmed in the following days while I was there, both by the observations of my colleagues as well as my own, and by the remarks made by visitors and staff with whom I spoke. When I asked the director of the Meervaard what inclusivity meant for him, he said he believed the place was inclusive when you'd walk into it and, quote, feel like your senses have been stimulated in a positive way, end quote. His answer was jaw-dropping to me. I was completely surprised by the sensibility of it. In fact, as soon as I heard it, I was transported to the warmth I felt when I thought about what inclusivity meant to me. Having trailed a path in which I moved through many frames and knowledge that emphasize the living body and the embodiment of experiences has made me aware of a systemic alienation from the body. In my experience, it is still rare that someone will explain something such as inclusivity by using the senses, which is why I was so surprised by his answer. I felt a tingling sensation run through my body, which I understood as the excitement of feeling connected to him and believing that our way of looking at things was perhaps closer than it seemed. Fieldwork. Detention space. My team for this week's challenge consisted of myself and one research partner. We shared a migrant path both of us coming from an economically less privileged country, where we had a reasonably privileged life that did not suffice, and which we decided to trade for a life as a student migrant in the Netherlands, with all its privileges and hassles. Besides that, our stories had other parallel points, such as a similar taste for music venues and outfits, as pointed out by some of our colleagues. Most importantly, we had both been working for the same harm reduction organization a Dutch NGO whose mission is to promote health and increase the legal status of people who use drugs. His path trailed through psychology, anthropology, and harm reduction, and mine through anthropology, harm reduction, and nonviolent communication. Through different but similar paths, we both learned to pay attention to emotions, communication, and embodied experiences. When the time came to choose a research topic, we were both intuitively attracted to the possibility of approaching social inclusion by looking at inclusivity of people who are already part of a community. When the time came to choose a research topic, we were both intuitively attracted to the possibility of approaching social inclusion by looking at the inclusivity of people who are already a part of that community, which allowed us to make the most of our stay and proximity with the research field. When introducing the concerns regarding social inclusion to the research teams, the director of the Meervaard brought up the disconnection between groups that form the Meervaard's community as a trigger or catalyst for conflict. The lack of connection was perceived as something that could stir conflict at worst, and at best was of no help preventing them. He moved on to tell us a story about a conflict that came up between distinct groups. The story was for my partner and me the trigger that stirred our research towards conflict. What kind of impact do conflicts have on inclusivity? How do conflict and conflict management strategies affect inclusivity? While the director moved on to tell us more about his perception of inclusivity, it became clear that many tensions that take place in the Meervaard are obstacles to inclusivity. The multitude of nationalities that come together in the Burt House only begin to point out the diversity in place. And as usual, 
With differences come disagreements and tension. We live in a world dominated by brutal inequality, where different value systems are empowered and where people might have competing interests or simply very different ideas and desires. Someone's idea of a safe space might be a threatening scenario for someone else. Securing inclusivity in such contexts is complex, and in the mirror the same conditions apply. So inclusivity is not necessarily a smooth process, and it will most often bring up friction and conflict. How do we deal with those? We follow the trail of conflict management experiences as a gateway to investigate social inclusion. When we started interviewing people in the Mirvard, it became noticeable how asking about conflict was a trigger for discomfort. People were most often either dismissive, showing a desire to get off topic, or they would make associations with escalated conflict. No one immediately mentioned lower level conflicts. The stories I heard mentioned drug abuse, police, expulsion, and so on, prior to disagreements, discomfort, or miscommunication. Despite that, we ended up learning from staff and volunteers that it was often harder to deal with minor conflicts or frictions, as we later started calling them. Frictions are lower-level conflicts, situations of discomfort without a clear-cut response or immediate solution. When a drunk visitor became aggressive to one of the employees or when one verbally assaulted another, behaviors that clearly disregarded the rules, the staff in charge of safekeeping seemed to find it easier to manage the situation. There was a protocol to follow and guidelines for it. However, in situations of discomfort or disagreement in which actions were not explicitly against the rules or could not easily be judged as wrongdoing, it was harder to care for it. That's where we turn our focus to emotions. Emotions I will share one of the stories we heard that can paint a good picture of friction. One frequent visitor of the center was an older woman from the neighborhood who appeared to bother other visitors. How she approached them, her body odor, and her appearance were all things mentioned by the person who told me the story as things they believed bothered others. I remember the director telling me that inclusivity is when people's senses are stimulated in positive ways. How can staff and volunteers care for everybody's senses in this case? According to the same staff member, the woman was also very kind and generous. They told me their affection for her and their belief that she should feel welcome in the bird house made it hard for them to deal with the complaints they heard about her. In this conflict or friction, those responsible for safekeeping the place felt the tension between the comfort of some visitors and the somehow annoying presence of someone they also cared for needed to be addressed. We looked into what kind of support was offered for staff and volunteers to deal with similar situations. Training was indeed offered to prepare them to deal with conflicts. However, it did not suffice to support them when dealing with friction. As a result, when people were emotionally implicated in friction, Systematic problem-solving skills that do not account for their emotions leave them hanging. When hearing the stories we heard in our fieldwork, we realized that the challenge to inclusivity we'd like to work on was how to improve the quality of people's experiences when dealing with friction and the emotions that arise from it. We decided that our intervention would approach emotional knowledge and supporting language and communication approaches. How can we help them? Concept and product. We narrowed down a few things we believed could help them come a long way. The first was to empower people to self regulate. The second was to empower people to communicate their emotions with assertiveness. The third was to have a clear message about the desires and goals of the Mirvard for the communication of the community. To frame our solution, we were inspired by the window of tolerance something that my partner and I know from our times working with harm reduction. The window of tolerance is a term and concept based on neuroscience that describes the optimal zone in which we can exist. That zone is characterized as the space in which we can self-regulate, be curious in the face of discomfort, and retain our sense of presence. Therefore, we wanted to offer staff and volunteers access to tools that will help them increase their window of tolerance. We base our proposal on techniques and knowledge deriving from mindfulness, 
also used in harm reduction interventions, which is a technique that aims to bring practitioners to an advanced state of awareness of the present, paying attention to feelings or emotions, sensations and the environment. Nonviolent communication, an approach to communication that focuses on nonviolence and that is based on core concepts and principles, such as the universal human needs, the need for connection and contribution in communication, and the premise of the interdependence of people, was also established as a pillar for our intervention. Even though we were focusing on staff and volunteers, we understood that efforts would likely not yield much improvement if visitors were left out of this process. So we wanted to create a product that would cater for staff, volunteers, and visitors as well. We decided to create a booklet that would offer an introduction to the vocabulary and practices of nonviolent communication and mindfulness. Besides that, the booklet should also be a means for the Mirvar to explicitly share with the community their ideals for communication. The idea was the booklet could give content about emotional knowledge and point out ways in which people could practice more assertive emotional communication. First independently, as awareness and self-regulation, and then with others when they would exchange and negotiate strategies to address any friction together. The graphics and format were meant to give the booklet versatile features, such as dividing the content into pages that could stand alone and be used as posters, which could be spread on the walls of the Mirvart. Testing When testing the product, a couple of things came to our attention. The first was input from a designer who was there to help with prototyping. They pointed out the possibility of using colors and non-written graphic signs to be able to present the content even to an illiterate audience. That instigated in us a desire to pursue the investigation of which other formats we could use to effectively share the content we had. That instigated in us a desire to pursue the investigation of which other formats we could use to effectively share the content we had in order to make it more inclusive. Unfortunately, the time of our boot camp did not allow for us to go further with this, but it was noted as one of the biggest limitations of our proposal and possibly one of the priorities for further investigation. The other input we had was that many people reported that the content was not new to them and that they already knew those things but other people didn't, and that made it a good and relevant intervention. To me, this feedback had a reassuring effect. It reassured my confidence in the idea that most people understand the value and the positive effects of assertive communication, even if they might not have the resources to see it through. The fact that it was recognizable also points to the possibility of it being easier to assimilate. Conclusion in our messy kitchen, a beautiful way the organizers of the boot camp used to name the messy and sometimes ugly part of the process, we were exposed to the possibility of framing a not too big of a problem. The input that the content was known touches on a concern we had during the process, which was simply, what if our problem is not big enough? In a way, to me, this concern connects to the same thought process that made people think of escalated conflicts before considering friction as something worth the attention. But sometimes, the smallest or most delicate efforts can be the revolutionary ones. What we propose with our intervention is that people do not take for granted the impact that tension and friction have on inclusivity. Imagine the impact of never again fighting over the dirty dishes. Does that make you envision a positive impact worth pursuing or not? Besides. If we're able to deal with minor level conflicts or friction, that sure informs us and prepares us to deal with escalated conflicts. Rapid ethnography has many challenges. However, despite the impression that it is too different from longer ethnographic research, the limitations are quite similar. Research will always be insufficient, whether it takes 10 days or 10 years. Reality is constantly changing and we're not able to keep up with it nor would we be able to comprehend it and describe it fully at any time. We will always lack. Regardless, that should not push us out of doing it. It will always be insufficient, but it might just as well be worth it. 
What moves me towards the desire to propose this intervention is the understanding that interventions to increase inclusivity have to aim to include people with everything they are. There is no such thing as partial inclusivity. To include people while not including and welcoming their emotions is not partial inclusivity. It is not inclusivity at all. Our bodies are a vital expression of our existence, and the emotions we feel cannot be put apart from any of our lived experiences. Once we can deal with our emotions and the vulnerability it takes to express them by securing a safe space for connection and communication, we will really be on our way to create truly inclusive spaces.